started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, wasn't sure what tonight's uh, turnout was going to be like. Uh, you know, I don't know. This is the right format right now, when given the status of uh, what happened or what happened during the election last night um, and this morning, whether us getting together and drinking wine is a uh, is a appropriate way to, I don't know, appropriate thing to do, appropriate thing to do. But I don't know. I like the idea of uh, being in the community with you all and drinking some wine, and you know, we can all maybe drink our sorrow away or. Or just drink some wine and hang out and just be in each other's uh, presence. And I think uh, um, that's uh, important right now. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. Uh, anyways, thank you all for being here. Um, welcome to the New Year's Eve sparkling box. I do this every year. So I put together a sparkling box. Um, I know how much Dave T enjoys these uh, nothing but sparkling boxes. But, uh, you know. A lot of people do. So, Dave, sorry. You're just going to have to keep, uh, put up with it. I'm still here. I should know. Yeah. I mean, one day we'll, we'll get you to see uh, see the light and, and then join us on the sparkling love uh, train. But, uh, you know, until then, you know, I, I'm going to keep trying. So, uh, anyways, yeah. So, these are all kind of the sparkling wines that I'm excited to kind of pop open uh, for New Year's Eve this year. doesn't have to be New Year's Eve. I do think Americans in, in general tend to think of sparkling as only like a celebratory kind of thing. But when you actually go to uh, old world, uh, sparkling is not just celebratory. I mean, it's actually used, enjoyed just as part of uh, everyday drinking. Um, and I think uh, we should adopt that more here in America. Um, sparkling wine is delicious. Uh, not only that, just because uh, uh, in order to make good sparkling wine, the acidity has to be really high. So, which means it oftentimes is a, a very good food pairing wine. Um, it is very versatile in terms of where it can go. Um, so I think it's personally a really, really fun and, and, and versatile wine. Um, so here we are. But besides that, these are just kind of four bottles that uh, that I thought would be super cool. Um, it doesn't have to be this way, but I kind of uh, put them in the order of how would I want to open them if like this was New Year's Eve. So this may be something, you know, because it's like New Year's Eve, like you're not going to wait until 1259, 1255 to open up your first bottle of wine. Like I'm already going to be drinking. So maybe having something, something festive, uh, nothing, something not too high in ABV to kind of start off, you know, in the early in the evening, maybe late afternoon, even. Uh, I thought this would be the kind of perfect thing. Um, so, yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to start off this one. And then there's going to come a half bottle. We got a unbelievable badass champagne uh but it's a half bottle because uh otherwise um that bottle alone would have taken all my budget for the entire box uh so yeah we got a half bottle of champagne which i want to pop for the actual new year's eve a midnight uh celebration and then you know obviously celebration goes on and you can't always you need another bottle to kind of keep you going so we got kava that's coming um that is uh uh, excellent, excellent alternative to uh, champagne. And then finally, to wrap it all out, uh, it's going to be a little Shannon and Pinot uh, uh sparkling from Loire Valley. So that one has a lot more fruit, has a little more, a lot more approachable. Um, uh, yeah, by end of the night, you know, you don't need to be drinking anything serious. It's just something that is delicious and ready to get, uh, get you going. And if you are one of those uh, uh, people who uh, I think two and a half bottles of wine in New Year's Eve is too much, then you can save the last one. I think it's an excellent brunch wine. Um, so yeah, uh, save that for the next morning and then you can consume that in the next morning. Um, but even besides that, just so you know, uh, besides the the wine today, which is a pet man, and we're going to talk about that, what that means. Most of you already know what it is. Um, but the rest of the three are all method traditional uh, or method champ noir. Um, so we're talking about the same uh, production method, um, but the, a the lees aging is all different between all three bottles. So this is kind of a study in that kind of autolytic, lees surly aging uh, development uh, in flavors. Um, so it's not just, you know, we're popping open bottles that are cool and delicious, but there's going to be some geeky, nerdy uh, component to it as well. So we can kind of uh, do a comparative tasting. Uh, throughout the month. Um, so yeah, that's the whole kind of uh, uh, idea behind all the bottles uh, this month. But 
first and foremost, they're all sparkling. So they're delicious. They're festive. Um, so hopefully you guys all enjoy it this month. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, Case Club opens tomorrow. Uh, so by the way, there are no new rookies. There are some people who haven't joined in a while who are joining back this month, but there are no new rookies uh, uh, this month. So I'm not going to go over the name and ground rules and all the explanation that I usually do on the first of the month. Um, so yeah, we'll go a little bit faster today. Uh, but Case Club uh, opens tomorrow. So all the wines that we tasted for Thanksgiving box the last month, um, these are all the wines that you know I'm excited to bring to Thanksgiving table and open up this year. Uh, and plus a bunch more that didn't make it into the box. These were all fantastic wines that I really honestly was this close to making into the box, but, but one way for one reason or another, I just could not put it in the box. Um, but they're all gonna be up there as well. So check them out. Um, really fun kind of a selection of wines. They're gonna go up on Case Club uh, tomorrow. So keep my eye, uh, keep your eye for my email for that. Uh, and soon, before the end of the week, uh, by Friday, uh, you're gonna get an email from me for Bojbox. Uh, so Bojbox 5.0 is coming. Uh, so I just wanna get an idea of who's interested. Uh, just so I can get an idea of how to prepare, how many, all of that. So uh, keep your eye out for that as well. Um, but it will be similar as last year and the years before, probably 375 somewhere around there, uh, price-wise, uh, plus or minus um, like 25 bucks, depending on the final selection of the wine. Um, but yeah, it'll be right around there. Uh, besides that, don't really have any other announcements besides... Six Foot Wine Club is committed to donating 1% of its gross revenue to an organization whose mission statement aligns with values. And this month, I have chosen WABA, uh, Washington Area Bicycle Association. Um, so if you want to donate alongside Six Foot Wine Club or want to learn more about what they do, uh, go ahead and check it out. It's in the chat box. Uh, any questions? Bubbles at a funeral. That's more my vibe right now. Damn. All right, getting getting a little dark today, but I like it. All right, uh, I don't know. I actually don't know uh, if they drink bubbles at a funeral in, in France or not. Not sure. It's a good question, though. What do what do French drink at a funeral? I don't know. Uh, all right, hearing no question, let's get to the wind. We're starting with this guy. These uh, these legs popping out of a glass. Uh, is what we're tasting. 2023 Domaine de Chest Moon, uh, Chest Boon, uh, Penat is basically what we're tasting today. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, this is the only non uh, method traditional uh, wine. So this is a Penat, short for Petiant Naturel, in case uh, those of you who are curious. Um, it just in French, all that means the natural bubbles. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get the production method, what that means, and how it's made. But let's start with the man. And where is the share button? Where did it go? A oh, share, there you go. Um, It's not the picture I wanted. That's the one. All right. So this should look pretty familiar. Uh, here's a map of France, right? Um, hold on. Let me just move this around a little bit. Move the screen. There you go. Um, yeah, map of France. Where we are is in Savoie. Um, most of you who've been around for a while, uh, you remember Jura and Savoie box that we did, the Alpine mountain wine, the French one, mountain wine. Um, it's one of our favorites uh, that we've ever had, um, but it's right here, Savoie. So it is bordered by Switzerland uh, to the north, right? And, uh, or to Jura, and then Switzerland to the east and Italy. Um, but this right area right here is where we are. Um, as you can see, there's this mountainous region that comes down right here is the French Alps uh, or the Alps that come down 
through the Switzerland Italian border into France is essentially what divides these three countries, right? And then there's another mountain range, uh, kind of subsidiary of of the Alps that come down through Jura on the other side of Jura. So this kind of in the middle, uh, kind of a flatter part between these high mountains is Savoie, and that's where uh, right through the Rhone River, which flows through. Uh, uh, connects uh, Lyon and uh, Lake Geneva, which is right up here. Uh, this lake is uh, Lake Geneva. Uh, yeah, this uh, kind of river valley, kind of flatter part is uh, what we're talking about in Savoie. But when I say flat, don't assume that that is low in elevation. This is still very much of a high mountainous kind of area. It's in the Alps, it's an Alpine region. Um, very small region, about only about like 2000 hectares under vine. Uh, it accounts for only about 0.5% of the entire French wine production. So we're talking about a very, very, very small uh, wine producing area. Uh, but, and for the longest time, um, as you can imagine with the Alps being right here, this is kind of a ski chalet, ski resort town. Uh, the wines of Savoie has long been kind of a the simple ski chalet, opera, like, you know, you just kind of pound it while you're uh, between ski sessions kind of wine, but all of that is really changing. Uh, as you saw with the Jura and Savoie box, but hopefully again with this, and we featured this producer before that, Tres Luna, he really loved uh, his wines. Um, and, you know, through the kind of careful and uh, work of the local winemakers like himself, uh, Tres Luna here, uh, the kind of image of Savoie wine being from these kind of a simple one note, ski chalet wine to being something of actual high quality and something that can even age. Um, so all of that is changing. Uh, for those of you who are looking for kind of a unique style uh, of wine uh, and with a definite, like a distinct sense of place, uh, this is actually a great place to explore. Um, oh, I should show you this. And before we get there, if you look at Savoie a little more closely, this is what I'm talking about. So Geneva, Lake Geneva, or Lake Lemon, Lemon is what they call it in, in France. Um, and uh, Lake Bourget was down here. Uh, and they're connected by this river, the Rhone River that comes up. Um, so this kind of uh, area between these two mountains regions is Savoie. Um, they're kind of all disconnected, kind of divided into three different kind of regions. Um, but even within that, there are sub-regions in it. We've actually featured wines from Frangy before. We've wines, uh, featured wines from Zong, uh, Zhongyu, right? Uh, and then Xinyan down here. The uh, Gonet Rosé that we get by cases every spring comes from this area, Xinyan. This is where it's made. Uh, we've had wines from Apomo. Um, So yeah, we've had wines from this region a few times on this wine club, um, but just kind of uh, refresh your memory. This is where we are and this is what it looks like. Um, this is a climate wise, it's a very uh, continental. So meaning it gets quite hot in the uh, summertime, but it gets quite, quite cold in the winter time. But what makes it possible for viticulture to exist is because of these kind of large bodies of water, the Geneva Lake and uh, Bourget Lake and the Rhone River that flows through, there's a, quite a bit of a moderating influence. In fact, this little valley right here between these two regions, I mean, you can't even call it a valley. There are two separate mountains and all of that, but it's kind of a flatter part between two mountain ridges. Um, they kind of have its own microclimate here, um, especially because all the vineyards here are kind of facing uh, south and southeast facing. So even though they're all planted above a thousand feet of elevation being quite high, uh, they get a little bit of kind of a Mediterranean uh, moderated uh, climate, meaning the winter here is not as um, severe as you would find in other parts of uh, the Alps, in the Alpine region. In fact, uh, the you will find crops like figs, apricot, olives, which are all Mediterranean crops, right? Actually growing among, uh, amongst vines in this region, um, just to give you an idea of uh, what kind of different microclimate this uh, uh, these uh, bodies of water create. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, people who are really interested in like a different style of wine that uh, to look for within France, this really fun area, um, which you can see, this is actually a geological, uh, 
yeah, geological map of the region. Um, here's Geneva right here. So this kind of a section right here is is a subwalk. So as you can see, there's just many different soil types, many different uh, kind of exposition in terms of uh, it's facing, most of it's south and southeast facing, but different soil types and having different, um, that kind of a microclimate within a very continental alpine high elevation zone. It produces a very unique style of wine that you cannot really find anywhere else. Um, it is very singular in its kind of expression, uh, oftentimes in its style. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, people who are kind of looking for a different place, something different. Um, all of wines that I get from Savoie uh, have this kind of a, a, a alpineness. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to tasting it, but it almost feels like I can taste the, the forest, the, 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 the Alps in here. Um, and this uh, wine definitely has that as well. Uh, there's a, a few different uh, appellations here. Uh, let's go back to that. Yeah, here we go. So overarching kind of a big regional uh, appellation here is Vende Savoie. Um, it's the largest amount of wine uh, is under Vende Savoie. So these uh, this pink regions right here, um, they can come from anywhere here. Can come from anywhere within Savoie. Um, but then uh, Roussette de Savoie, which is uh, uh, Altas. Uh, we've had the, what was the name of the producer, the Eugene Carell, uh, that everybody loves uh, or loved. Uh, that is a, they call it Roussette um, here, but it's uh, Altesse is the name of the variety. So Roussette de Savoie comes from Frangi region and some over here and down here is at this orange places. This is where you can make 100% varietal Altesse variety uh, wines. Um, so there's that. And uh, Seisel has its own kind of a, uh, uh, appellation, but in general, Vende Savoie is what we're talking about in general. Uh, this is a white wine dominant region. 70% uh, of the wine produced here are white wines. Um, so for those of you who are white wine fans, this is a great place. Um, uh, most of it is planted to and made from a local indigenous uh, grape variety called Jacquer, which is what this wine is made from, 100% Jacquer. Uh, and other uh, wines are made from Altesse. Uh, some other varieties that are that are um, significant in this region is Altesse, like I mentioned, which is also called Roussette or Roussan. Uh, for those of you who are grown white fans, uh, that is also grown here. And then there's quite a bit of Chardonnay also being grown here as well. So, you know, it being close to Burgundy and, uh, and, and uh, Jura, which is, as you can see, Burgundy and Jura are just right up here in the Savoise here. Um, there's obviously a lot, quite a bit of a, a Chardonnay being grown here. And for the red wines that are uh, uh, small percentage of small, uh, red wine that's being made here is really what we're talking about is Mondus and Gamay. Uh, we've had both of those wines from here before. Uh, there, in general, there are about 23 different varieties that are allowed here in Savoie. But really, uh, those three are kind of, or those uh, five are the major varieties that you kind of really need to know. So uh, Jacquer, Altesse, Roussan, Chardonnay, and Mondus, uh, and, and uh, Gamay. So, uh, also, it's not just the steel wine that Savoie is known for. If you know this name right here, Chambéry, you might have heard this name. Uh, there's a huge vermouth production that happens here in Chambéry. Um, the, you might have all seen, if you are a cocktail drinker or a martini drinker, you might have seen the brand Dolan that's everywhere in every bar. That's a Chambéry. That's a vermouth. It's a, it comes from right here. Um, also, this mountain range that comes down here is, uh, it's fun to say, but uh, for those of you who really like chartreuse, who you've heard of chartreuse, those are green and yellow French herbal liqueur uh, that's made by Benedictine monks. Um, one of the kind of like the noble kind of liqueur of uh, of uh, of France that comes from um, down here. Um, so down here uh, between Chambéry and Grenoble, this area is called Chart. Mountain range. I know I just say shark, but it's C H A R T. 
uh, Chart mountain range right here. Um, and that's where Chartreuse comes from. So it's not just still wine that Savoie is known for, in case you have not heard of Savoie, but you surely, if you are going to any hipster or any nice cocktail bars in America, you've definitely probably had some uh, Dolan Vermouth that comes from Chambéry, definitely some Chartreuse that comes from Chart Mountain, which is right down here as well. So, um, all right, who makes this wine? Uh, it's this guy. Um, his name is Sylvain Leotard, uh, Domaine de Tresloon, uh, the wine estate of 13 moons is what, it, what the translation is to English. Uh, he spent 17 years as a carpenter, um, and then he decided to search out a more pastoral kind of vocation. So he started working for different wineries, started training as a winemaker, and that was back in 2014. And during this training, he kind of realized that he wasn't getting paid all that well. Turns out winery jobs are very low paying jobs. Uh, so he uh, created a cooperage company specializing in restoration of old barrels. Uh, that's, so that's how kind of he supported himself while he was getting trained. Uh, but just by chance, he actually ended up uh, taking over the current domain, the Tres Loon, uh, the owners were selling and he just happened to know them. So he took it over along the slopes of a famous Mont Grenier, which is this mountain back here, uh, uh, back in 2016. By the way, why is this famous, or maybe I should say infamous? So back in 1200, uh, this mountain had a huge, huge landslide uh, that buried something like uh, like 26 different villages that was under it. Uh, so basically all the, the Savoie appellations that we know right now down here, all this was basically buried and it is built back on, on top of the basically buried villages. So there's a lot of kind of a local saying about maybe all these ghosts of the past versus what's keeping the wineries and then the wine. So it's interesting here, but yeah, uh, that mountain that you saw in the background of Sylvain uh, in 1200 is really leveled. And that's kind of what gave a lot of that kind of a, a the, the soil type kind of spread that happens on that map, a geological map that I saw. Uh, so yeah. In one way, it's a tragedy, but in another way, it was a great thing for the wine. So, you know, um, but yeah, so that's what it is. Here's another shot of him. Um, but young guy, he's his wife, uh, Anne and Sylvain. Uh, here's another shot of the vineyard. This is actually his winery. His home is attached to it. So he lives there. Uh, he makes wine in this uh, vineyard right here. And again, right underneath the Mont Grenier. Pretty, uh, Here's during shot during the harvest. Um, yeah, and then this is what this is actually has nothing to do with them, but this is a shot of Xinyan. Um, this is kind of what the region looks like. Here's a Mont uh, Grenier as well. Um, but yeah, very, very pretty, uh, very beautiful area. I've never been there. Um, love to go. Actually, Jura Savoie, this whole area is uh, kind of the next place on my list in terms of where to go in France. Um, but yeah, uh, highly recommend going there to ski and drink some. Upper Mont and and yeah, have a, and uh, enjoy the scenery here. Uh, anyways, uh, so he ended up taking over Domaine de Tresloon in 2016. Uh, this is kind of where he started his own path after only about what is that two years of uh, uh, switching jobs, uh, switching career, and then becoming a or starting to train like a winemaker as a winemaker. So a lot of it is learning from his own mistakes staying open to the advice and tips from his friends and established neighbor, which is at Domain Giacchino. Um, and if you remember that uh, name, uh, we've had their wines from them uh, earlier this year, or was it last year? Uh, the Jacques Bou is the pet name, uh, again from Jacques Hare that we had, um, that, was, uh, that was made from Giacchino, but it was his neighbor. So pretty established name in the natural wine world. And so he got, he was pretty lucky to have them as a neighbor. So he got a lot of uh, tips and advice from them. Uh, he immediately started converting his uh, 5.7 hectares of vineyards. So very, very small holdings. In fact, the uh, tree structure here, most producers uh, are very, very small. I mean, as you can see, none of these are very kind of connected vineyards. They're all kind of scattered throughout the region. Um, so yeah, very small vineyard holding, 5.7 hectares. 
uh, he immediately started converting to organic and biodynamic in his first year. Uh, in the same year that uh, he started uh, farming, uh, there were three terrible episodes of spring frost, and he lost 75% of his harvest. Uh, but undeterred, he kind of forged on, and then now he farms all of his vineyards fully organically and biodynamically, and they're actually certified by EcoCert and Demi uh, Demeter, uh, respectively, since 2022. Uh, he makes both white and red, um, and make and sparkling as well, obviously. And uh, he makes wines in the appellation of uh, Abim, Epremont, and Rousset de Savoie as well. Uh, importer actually sent me an email. Um, he sent them uh, years ago, kind of explaining his approach and like a winemaking philosophy, and it kind of resonated with me quite a bit uh, in terms of why his uh, wines uh, speak to me so much. Um, but I thought I would read that for you here. So Sylvain wrote, each day I'll try to be happy in my life as a winemaker to take care of the life that surrounds me, to be creative in my own process, practice biodynamic farming, and to produce wines that are a photograph of the past year in order to share with everyone this small bit of history. To work organically and biodynamically is to take care of the soil, anticipate disease, and work as much as possible with the plant infusions and concoctions, but also to intervene as little as possible during vinification, watch closely each day, and master the process of fermentation. And of course, to be patient and confident is what he wrote when asked what his guiding principle uh, behind his uh, winemaking was. So, I mean, it's everything that, you know, I talk about. I say a lot about in, uh, in Six Foot Wine Club. So no wonder his wines uh, resonate. Uh, so what is this wine? This is 100% organic Jacquer. Uh, couldn't really find a whole lot of information. I think he makes very little of this wine. Um, and even the importer didn't have a lot of uh, technical information on this. Uh, but it's essentially, um, it's, it's vinified in, in uh in stainless steel, a mixture of stainless steel and then a fiberglass tank that he has. And then afterwards, and this is how Pennet is made. This is uh, the method that this sparkling gets into this wine is called method ancestral, ancient method. It's likely the very first uh, way how the kind of a bubbly wine was probably ever made, which is probably an accident how one was first made. Um, but essentially you, start fermenting the wine, right? You put it in a, a vessel, whether it be stainless steel, fiberglass tank or whatnot. You let it start fermenting. And before it ferments out completely dry, meaning before the yeast cells eat up all the sugar in the wine, they bottle the wine inside the exact same bottle that we're, we're tasting today. Um, and they cap it. Uh, oftentimes with a crown cap, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, this one happens to be crown cap. So, uh, you cap it with a crown cap, so the remaining sugar is eaten by the yeast that's in the wine. It uh, pees out alcohol, and then it farts out CO2, and then there's nowhere for the CO2 to go, so it dissolves into the wine, and the wine becomes sparkling. And oftentimes, they will dis disgorge the wine, meaning just to get rid of those all the yeast cells that were left in there to make the wine less cloudy. So they will usually keep it upside down while the yeast, all the leads are collected at the top of the uh, uh, neck of the bottle. And then they'll pop it open. So all the pressure that's built will shoot all of that out. And then they'll fill it back up with a little bit of base wine. And that's essentially how, and then they'll cap it again. That's essentially how Pennet is made. Not all Pennet is disgorged, but given uh, the amount of uh, cloudiness in this wine, as well as... Uh, kind of is stability, a lot of undisgorged uh, pen mats that will oftentimes explode when you <laughs> open it, just because too much uh, pressure is built. But just seeing how common it was and how not as cloudy as it could be, uh, I'm assuming this was disgorged. Again, I can I couldn't uh, verify that information, but I'm pretty sure this was uh, disgorged. So basically, 100% Jacques Air came into the winery. He crushed it, prepped it off the skins. Uh, immediately threw in the stainless steel tank or the uh, fiberglass tank, started to let it ferment. And before it was done fermenting, he bottled it, capped it, let the uh, fermentation completely uh, finish. And then he disgorged it, topped it off with a little bit of base wine, and then um, kept it back up. 
and and that's what, how this wine is made. Uh, and that is essentially how Penat is made. So anytime you hear the word Penat, or anytime you go to a restaurant or wine bar these days and see a Penat section, those are all the wines that are made with that. Uh, the difference between that and uh, Method Traditional uh, is that Method Traditional, you go through two different fermentations, right? This one is one single fermentation. It just goes from tank into the bottle. And the and, and Method Traditional, which we'll talk about next week uh, in more in details. Uh, the second fermentation, the, the, there's actually two separate fermentations. There's one fermentation to make the base wine, and then you start the second fermentation by adding yeast and sugar to the wine or or a frozen must. Um, so it, it's a two separate fermentation as opposed to this one. It's a one single fermentation. And we'll, we'll talk about what you do in a, in a traditional method uh, next week. But uh, in general, stylistically speaking, pen nets tend to be a little bit bigger bubbles, a little more aggressive. And it's also because it hasn't spent so much time on under um, in bottles, the bubbles tend to dissipate faster, so it'll go flat uh, faster. Uh, and it's never really meant to be aged for a long time. Pen nets are meant to be consumed young and fresh, it's supposed to be more of an approachable kind of a, a beverage rather than a traditional method uh, that has a lot more autolytic flavors, a lot more layers and complexity and savoriness and all of that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of stylistic difference, but it's not always true as you will particularly see with the last bottle of this month, even though that also goes through a traditional method, the flavor profile, the freshness of that bottle um, is, 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 uh, is pronounced uh, compared to the other two, just because it has spent less time. So just because you went through a traditional method does not mean it is gonna be savory, autolytic and all of that, but it all kind of depends on how much time it spends on the leads. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come, but for today, for this week, know that this is a method ancestral, which is a different method than method traditional. And then this is how pen nuts are made. And it's oftentimes just uh, for more for freshness and then uh, immediate kind of approachability. Cool. Any questions about anything that I will just went over before question. we get into this? Yeah, what's up? How does he know when the uh, the, the second fermentation is done that he wants to disgorge it? I mean, how does he tell? He just guesses. probably pop pop on open and then taste it, honestly. Or he, he can uh, he can do a lab test as well just to see. I mean, that's how they uh, the winemakers uh, monitor fermentation. They're constantly like uh, once. So it takes a little bit of time for fermentation to start. So when it first starts, it's going up by like 0.1 degrees, 0.2 degrees uh, alcohol level. It's, it starts off very, very slow. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of takes off where it's jumping a percent like every day, more than a percent, one to 2% a day. Um, and then you got to kind of monitor that uh, pretty closely, especially during that fast, rapid fermentation time. Um, that's where a lot of people watch the temperature. They'll either drop the uh, temperature of the fermenting solution, just kind of slow down the fermentation, or you can speed up by uh, warming it up. And the reason why they watch that is the speed of the fermentation kind of controls what kind of uh, chemical compounds are released. So a lot of fast, quick and fast fermentations tend to produce a lot more estery kind of uh, uh, compounds. So oftentimes like a tropical nose, little even banana, um, these kind of, uh, uh, again, estuary notes um, tend to come out a lot more uh, in, in a faster fermentation. As opposed to in a slower fermentation, you, uh, you uh, risk possibly the fermentation being stuck, meaning it needs another kind of a jump start for it to keep going kind of killing up the momentum, but you get to kind of preserve a lot of the natural kind of uh, um, aromas and flavors rather than the flavors or aromas that are created by the fermentation itself. Um, that's a very geeky answer to your very simple question. But uh, yeah, so because it's in the bottle, he's not drawing, drawing it off of a, of a barrel. Honestly, he probably at this point has an idea of how long it's gonna take for the sugar to be consumed. Um, he knows at what sugar level he's bottling these wines because he he definitely he would test that. Um, 
and probably has an idea of how long it's going to take for it to go for, uh, completely dry. And then around that time, he'll probably start popping open bottles, just kind of taste it and to make sure that nothing's gone wrong. So. Any other questions? I've also seen PenNet bottles explode because they bottled it way too soon. So there was too much sugar left uh, in, uh, in the wine uh, when they bottled it. So by the time the yeast ate up all the sugar, the pressure got too high and then the bottle started exploding um, in the winery. And it's uh, it's pretty scary because the actual bottle, you see these bottles, you start hearing like these pop noise. And you're like, what, what is happening? And you go there. And then all these bottles are starting to pop. Um, yeah, it's, so that much pressure can be built in in, in the wine. So I was curious uh, because we've enjoyed Jura and we've enjoyed Savoie, and there's that region in between Bougie or I Bougie. Probably, yeah. Do, have you ever tried anything from there? Yeah. Uh, for the longest time, they so they make these. Uh, uh, Bougie Cerdon, which is a, a kind of like a sweet, like half, it's more than off dry. Um, it's it's sweet, basically uh, rosé sparkling wine, very low sparkling wine. Uh, delicious with like chocolates or fruit salad and things like that. But oftentimes it was just like, didn't have enough acid or it was kind of cloying and all of that. But all of it is also changing. Uh, there's some really, really, uh, careful winemakers that are making this kind of classic style of bougies alone in a in a very artistic way um, or artisanal way. So I've had some really good ones um, that made me think twice about it. It's like, but for the longest time, yeah, wines from there, nobody really paid attention to it. There are some still wines made there too, but that's what they're most famous enough for. Uh, I actually wanted to put a bottle of Bougie in, in the Thanksgiving box, but for some reason, this year's vintage tasted very different from the past years. Um, I was lacking a lot of the kind of expressive fruit and like the berry salad that, that I really liked in the old, old vintage. Um, so I didn't end up putting it in there, but, uh, yeah, maybe next vintage, uh, when I taste it again, if it's good, I'll, I'll. I'll put it up on Case Club and remind you guys again. Uh, any other questions? Excellent. Let's taste the wine. All right. Since we have no new uh, new rookies, we can all take turns. Who's take the appearance? Come on, this one's easy. Come on, somebody. I can do a parent. All right, excellent, thank you. I have that to get upstairs and get a little more, but I have a little bit in here. Um, no, I... It is clear. Is it? Maybe, well, yeah, I only have a little bit left in my glass, but yeah, I guess it's, there's a little bit of a haze to it. Yeah, it's a clear ish. It's, yeah, it's, it's not fully like opaque and hazy, but yeah, it's not. It's not. It, it's yeah, it's not fully clear here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, intensity. Uh, I think this would be pale. Okay. Um, and it is. I guess lemon green i don't it's it's not lemon it to me it, but it's i don't i guess a little bit of green i don't know yeah it's got some little bit of color to it actually i yeah. i was gonna i was gonna call this like medium lemon pale gold there, there's something like a little gold fleck to this oh yeah i guess when i'm looking at this uh, yeah there's no i don't see any green to it but it's yeah, not yeah. super lemony yeah 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 <laughs> totally so okay. yeah pale gold medium lemon something like that uh, any other observations? Uh, there's uh, bubbles. There are definitely bubbles. <laughs> Although mine, mine have dissipated some. 
sitting yeah. there, but it was much more when I first poured it. Uh, and take a notice of this now, like make a memory of what these bubbles look like right now. Do you see, at least in my glass right now, there's kind of like a foam that's happening around the rims. There's even on the top surface of my wine. There's yeah, like when I first poured foam. it, it looked like that. Yep. Yeah, it's almost like a beer kind of a head. You know, there's like foaminess that's floating. Even the 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 bubble size here. It's not these kind of like a persistent metal streams of like fine needle prick point uh, bubbles that are coming out. It's more of this kind of like, it almost seems to be like coming from everywhere, just like kind of evaporating out of the wine. Um, yeah, and, and now that it's sitting a bit, it's it's not like champagne. It's not continuing to bubble. Exactly. So yeah. next week, especially because next week, we're going to go to champagne directly from here. So just make a mental note of this. So next week, when you come to look at the wine, you will see the difference in, in the bubble size, the consistency, persistency of the bubbles, uh, and almost like a complete clarity on the surface. It's, it's a very different kind of a character to the to the bubble. So yeah. yeah. Point that out. Um, cool. Excellent job. You get to pick the next person for the nose. Does anyone want to do nose? I can I can do the nose. I was just gonna say, well, you just popped up below Un, so there you go, David. Go. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, David. Um, clean. I don't. Yeah, this one is clean. This one is sound. Oh, Mister Duso is here. You you wanna you wanna say hi to the wine club folks, Jacob? Uh, all right, this one is clean. Intensity? Who's sorry? Am I doing it or who's doing it? <laughs> yeah, oh, you're yeah. doing it. Though. I'm doing it. Check up, everyone. Hey, how's it going? Um, intensity. I get it. It may be an inch off the rim. So, medium. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'll call this about medium. Not super expressive. Like, I'll get it. Yeah, just like right off the rim. Yeah, I'll call this about medium as well. Uh, what are my characteristics? Um, well, I'm get, I'll I'll just say I'm getting a ton of citrus right off the bat. Yeah, and there's something, it's like pine, so almost like a pine resin kind of thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, so yeah, to me, there's nothing floral here. Nothing green here, maybe like convince me there's some like really unripe, like yellow apple kind of a thing, but not really. Yeah, again, like you mentioned, citrus to me, this is like lemon, lemon peel, all of that. None of the stone, tropical fruit, red fruit, black fruit, none of that, all in the street. Um, and yeah, the what you mentioned just right now, that pine sole, that is to me what is very unique about this region. And again, this could be power of suggestion, knowing that this comes from a very alpine region. But to me, Jacques particularly, but I get it some in Alpes as well, but particularly Jacques from Savoie has that kind of like pine salty, foresty, kind of like a green, but not in you know, a like vegetated, fresh cut grass green. It's like a like a shrubby kind of like like a resin, um, yeah. Like a resiny, yeah, that kind of green. And not on the me, grid, not on the grid. <laughs> and see, it's all right. We can't call it out. But I, I, I get that almost on all Jacquere from Savoie. So, yeah, and I definitely get it here as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that you call that out. Because, yeah, exactly. There's that resiny kind of like uh, tree sap kind of like greenness going on here, for sure. Um, anything else? Any spot? Oh, and then, and then just... Uh, Fruit note here, and your citrus. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because it, it's it's what I would call fresh fruit, but the resiny makes it almost taste smell a little bit like it's like there could be some cooked element to it. But mm. it yeah, to me, this is mostly still fresh. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I, 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 there's nothing that's stewy or jammy about this for me. Very fresh. Um, to me, if that resiny thing almost makes me feel like it's almost underripe, but like it's not, it's not necessarily underripe. I, I, I would call this fresh and ripe, but yeah, exactly. That resiny, pine salt, forest, green, um, kind of a kind of a vibe to it. Any spice or any stoniness? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. Me neither. Any secondary? Any tertiary? I can. You could give it to me. There's a little breadiness toast on there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little savory from just from the least content. I mean, it's very short. It's, it really didn't much. But to me, yeah, if anything, maybe a little yeasty, maybe a little autolytic, but really what we're talking about is primary here. Even primary, really, we're talking about citrus, that kind of herbaceous or herbal. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of what I got going on. Very, very uh, uh, straightforward kind of a wine. Um, to me, this tastes exactly like what I would expect that place to taste like. <laughs> You know, like a very alpine region, high altitude, high elevation wine. Like this is exactly what I would expect it to taste like. Um, cool. You get to pick the next person for the palate. Okay. Uh, below me is Phil. Phil Dehan. Philip. All right, Phil. Find the unmute button first. That helps. All right, so in the palate, this is a uh, dry wine. Got uh, a uh, medium acidity. Yeah? And uh, yeah, I'm going to call this a medium plus. I mean, it's not massive. Um, that's the thing about Jacquer. Jacquer also has a pretty good acidity. And also the wines that come from this place, it just very, it's high elevation site. It gets quite cold at, at nighttime as well as uh, in the wintertime. So the, the, the acidity here is always really, really good. That kind of an acid backbone. Um, what makes it beautiful here is that if that was the only case, the wines would be really green and underripe and all of that. But because mm -hmm. that microclimate mm -hmm. that I was telling you about, because that moderating influence of those uh, the big larger uh, bodies of water, and because of the high UV exposure from the southern slopes on a high mm -hmm. elevation site, the fruits actually ripen. They're able to ripen, mm -hmm. so you get this flavor development. Uh, you. Get the phenolic ripeness, uh, but also you are able to uh, uh, retain that acidity. Um, so I'm going to call this medium plus uh, on acidity. But uh, yeah, just uh, just it, it, wines in general that come from Jura and Savoie. It's a high altitude uh, mountain wines. Just expect uh, the the acidity to be elevated. So I, I don't get any tannin. No tannin. Yep. No tannin, and it's a. Um... A low medium alcohol. I mean, it's really lightweight. Yeah. There's no I, mean, at all. I don't even know what this is. 10%. Yeah. So oftentimes pen nets are not very high in in um in uh in ABV. Um so this is 10%, uh, which would put us right in low, very low, low end of medium minus, high end of low. Um so yeah, we're we're in the low ABV zone here. This is what 10% feels like in your body to help you calibrate your senses. Um, body. Body. Body's a medium to a medium minus. It's not a heavy, heavy body, I don't think. No, nope. I'll call this medium minus. Um, maybe even higher in the light, lower in the medium minus. It's not a yeah. it's not a full bodied one. Shakir never is. Um, so yeah, I'll call this about medium minus as well. Uh moose. Well, it's not creamy, but it's not aggressive either. So I don't know where to put it. Maybe in the middle between the two of them. Yeah, I mean, I'll go all the way because aggressive. There's some bubbles that are aggressive out there. Um, if anything, yeah, I'll call this a creamy. Uh, I, I've said this before. I think this is the the most the mousse is the most kind of like the imprecise uh, uh, line item <laughs> in the in yeah, the whole yeah. grid. Um, so it's like wait, yeah. 
but uh yeah if 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 i had to put this in somewhere it, it would be creamy uh but yeah okay. I, totally, I, I totally see what you mean it's like somewhere between aggressive and creamy yeah right in the middle there i mean i i really don't know how to judge that um uh, flavor intensity i would call this a medium to a medium plus it's yeah pretty good flavor all right, right. Uh, call it even more generous than i am yeah i'll call this about medium there's a medium um maybe high end of medium but yeah I'll call this one medium medium intense flavors of what do you got well i i get the same uh the same fruits that uh dave did yeah uh, it's no no tropical flavor no no floral taste lemon lemon, lemon zest yeah, lemon, lemon zest to me, this is all in the citrus zone right here. Citrus, and again, do, do you also agree with that kind of like pine salt, piney? Yeah, in fact, that's what I was thinking. There was some kind of cleaning solution smell. Pine See, salt. I, that's why I didn't want to say pine salt, because it all makes you sound like it's a cleaning solution. But to me, it's it's not that. It's like, to me, this is, yeah, there's. I mean, it's not, it's not. Uh offensive smell yeah it, it makes it sound bad but it, i mean it in the most in a in a very complimentary way you know it's got that like citrus and um fresh like green forest uh uh, uh aromas to me that's exactly what i get on this thing uh anything else on the secondary or tertiary no i don't have and nothing in the secondary or tertiary flavors yeah, don't get much secondary tertiary. It's really, we're talking about citrus, that resinous kind of a uh, mountain thing. But I will say this one thing though, both in terms of texture and this, this is going through the mineral part. There's saltiness here. There's a little bit of salinity at the end. Third thing that I got. So a little bit of salinity, but also texturally speaking, like this wine is not, like you know it's not round it's very like rigid and angular um it's very tight in terms of like its tension um and to me this is exactly a sign of all the wines that are grown on limestone and here this was grown on clay and limestone and uh this is one of the things why Savoy is also uh uh very well suited for viticulture is that there's a rich limestone bedrock that runs through this region um, which gives, again, this kind of tension and a backbone to the wine uh, on top of the acidity. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely some uh, um, evidence of uh, limestone, that kind of a tension, rigidity uh, uh, on, on this wine. Um, so I just want to call that out. But yeah, I get a little bit of salinity on this thing. Um, so in terms of minerality, I get it in, 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 a, in a form of uh, salinity. Uh, uh, finish. This is... Uh, it. It goes away quick, but there's a tartness that stays in your mouth. It, 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 so I, I wouldn't know where to put that, a medium plus? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think this is like medium, you know, maybe lower in the medium, high in the medium, minus. The flavors themselves tend to dissipate pretty quickly. But yeah, there's a little bit of saltiness that kind of like, to me, I'm left with like a salted lemon kind of a thing, but that lingers, the acidity lingers a little bit, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll call this about medium. I won't call this like super long. No, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Yeah. And, uh, so take it on for us, Phil. Okay, so I, this is a, uh, uh, a, I'd say it's good to very good. I'm, I'm enjoying drinking it. It, it. For a sparkling pet nap, it's, it, yeah, I like it. Excellent. And uh, so I'll go to I'll go to very good. And then to you, you should drink this now. Yeah. I don't think it'll last long. I mean, it, yeah. a year, two years. Yeah. Um, I agree with your call on, I would call this good. And, and I, I love that you're being very generous uh, here. Um, but yeah, I think this one is very well balanced. Complexity wise, you know, we called it citrus, the resinous forest um and but, that, but that's really no about it to keep it what's it there's no alcohol to keep it strong to keep it yeah strong. that too yeah and then there's a little bit of a um uh, maybe a touch of autolytic that they've mentioned but <laughs> really not a whole lot going on here so the 
complexity wise of what the lower end of medium, maybe even medium minus, right? And then uh, uh, concentration wise, we call the medium on the nose, medium on the palate, length we call the medium. So we're all kind of hitting right in the medium. So I'm gonna call this good. This one is good. Uh, for level of readiness for drinking, potential for aging, like Phil mentioned, uh, I would drink this now. Uh, not many pen nets, if barely any pen nets are meant to be aged for a very long time. This is meant for that kind of immediate consumption, freshness, all the refreshing kind of quality it brings. Uh, you get the purity of the fruit itself, Jacquer, the all the kind of the notes of what you'd expect from Jacquer, uh, all the citrus note, um, at the high acidity and all of that. But then you also get this uh, uh, sense of the place uh, from here, which is that resinous forest kind of a thing that's going on here. Uh, the limestone influence on the texture of the wine, a little bit of uh, savoriness, uh, uh, that salty kind of a tang that that, that comes uh, finishes at the end. So all around is exactly, you know, what what Sylvain was talking about in the in the uh, wine philosophy. You know, the photograph of what happened in the past year. Uh, just kind of moment in history through through uh, wine. And to me, this is exactly that. This is showing you exactly where it comes from, what it's made from, uh, and tastes exactly like where it should come from. Yeah. And shouldn't be aged. Um, yeah, like I said, maybe drink it over next year or two, but if you get a bottle, just drink it now. No no point in aging and uh, negative stuff. Excellent. Excellent, excellent job, everyone. Any questions about anything? Cool. Did you guys like this one, by the way? Did anybody not like this one? Just out of curiosity? Yeah? Okay. All right. Let's play this game. How much do you think this one is? How much does this wine cost on a retail shelf? How much would you be happy paying for this wine in a retail store? The pen net. Pen nets are never cheap. Sparklings are never like cheap, cheap. But, you know, it's also pen net, not like something that's aged for a very long time. No, it's, not. it's a good quality. All right, 20, 25, 25, 25, 24, 22, 26, 24, 28, 28. Yeah, these are all kind of in the ballpark. This wine on the retail shop would be 24, 20, 24, 75. That's basically what it come up. So yeah, for under 25 bucks for a bottle like this, I'm totally happy with that. Um, again, if I was skiing in that region, I would be pounding this like by the gallon. Let me tell you, ten percent, like every run, you know, every break, I'd be like, yeah, give me a glass. Like I'd be stoked to go to glass. So there you go. There you go. Any questions? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, just wanted to say a quick hello to our old friend, Mr. Terry Ria, who's joining us from Seattle. Hey. He joined us. He was like, are you doing a sparkling box? Can I join in? He like totally came in last one. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a slut for sparkling wine, so. Uh, how how are things in, in Seattle, Terry? They're good. It's, uh, the darkness has arrived. Yeah. So it's dark by four already. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Pacific Northwest, you know. Summertime is unbelievable, but winter can get yeah. real long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. Things are uh, but things are good otherwise. Going? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good, good. The Dave is uh still uh in the film industry having to travel a lot too? Uh he's not traveling too much. Uh, but yeah, he's still he's still uh, making crime TV stuff. So yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, 
I don't even know what I don't know what show he's working on right now, but it was Mean Girl Murders season two Ooh. or something. Ooh. <laughs> so <laughs> I like that. He's he's upstairs doing something right now, but uh, uh, um, how was the mood out there uh, after the election? Uh, as far as you can ascertain. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's similar to a lot of places <laughs> right now. Um, yeah. Shock. Um, although Washington State as a whole went pretty blue across the yeah. board. Yeah. So uh, governor, lieutenant governor, like all the way down. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was kind of a shock at work today. A lot of people all crying in my office and uh, concerned. So also